sometimes we get so carried away with something that we don't notice how deeply our enthusiasm engulfs us, leading to all sorts of mistakes. And later, freeing ourselves from that passion and fixing everything becomes quite difficult. I knew many people who passionately devoted themselves to their hobbies or immersed themselves in their favorite activities. My family wasn't an exception to this. Piper, my wife, with whom we have been living in a cozy house in a small town in a sunny state for almost 20 years, found an interest for herself in the local homemakers club a long time ago, where participants could share their signature dishes, try something new, and simply gossip. She went there almost every day, sometimes for several hours, yet managed to take care of all the usual household chores. Our daughter Melanie, after finishing school, moved to another city to study at college, allowing Piper to dedicate even more time to her hobby. Sometimes, I even liked it because after a hard day's work, I could come home and enjoy the quiet and peace. But, on the other hand, lately, I started noticing that Piper was somehow distancing herself from me. At first, I thought it was just my imagination since over the years, I got used to her always being at home and always being around. But then I began to realize that Piper was truly giving her all to this club. One evening, when I came home from work and found my wife there, I decided to talk to her about it. Not that I was against it, I just wanted her to be fully my wife again, not only on paper. Richard, you're talking nonsense, she blushed when I started talking to her. Why did you decide that I no longer love you? You weren't against it all this time, why suddenly change your mind? Yes, I wasn't against it. But you're not here anymore, not with me. You're completely absorbed in this club of yours. We hardly even communicate anymore. When did you manage to trade our family for this silly circle? It's not silly at all. But you started complaining about everything for no reason. I'm just relaxing there. Nobody prevents you from hanging out with your friends at the bar? Don't compare. I don't go there every day. And you. You've become so cold towards me. I don't recognize you anymore. Where is the piper I've loved all my life? The one I've spent so many years with? Nonsense, replied my wife, and she left the room. I didn't feel ashamed of my questions at all. But her reaction made me think that she had indeed grown cold towards me. Yes, we were not young anymore, but not too old either. I didn't demand too much from her, yet she started avoiding even the obligations of marriage, making up different excuses each time, being tired or having a headache. I didn't want to blame her for anything, but now she simply left me no choice. I approached her again, catching up with her in the kitchen, embraced her waist, and wanted to be with her as a woman. Despite her years, she still remained quite attractive, and for me, she had always been and would always be a beauty because she's my wife whom I love so much. But Piper began to wriggle out of my embrace, pushed me away with an irritated look, her tone becoming sharper, and her gaze turning sharp and empty. Have you completely lost your mind? She asked, displeased. I didn't like it at all, and I decided, no matter what, to figure out what exactly in that club captivated Piper and took her away from me. The next day, knowing when she was planning to leave, I called her beforehand asking how she was doing, and made sure she was heading to her club. At work, I asked my colleague to cover for me, and I went to the address where their meeting place was located. I even wondered why I hadn't visited their gathering place before. An ownerless single-story house, where the ladies arranged a gathering place for themselves, was located almost at the end of the town. It looked quite ordinary. Upon entering inside, I found myself first in the hallway and from there I already heard women's voices who had gathered in one of the rooms. I went there and peeked in. Several women were sitting around. They immediately noticed me and were surprised by my appearance. I actually came to see Piper. Is she here? I immediately asked. No, Richard. She hasn't arrived yet. Come on in. Would you like some tea? Clara. Piper's close friend, tried to be polite. But I didn't come here for that. Now I was even more intrigued about what wife was doing because, according to her words when I called, she should have been here long ago. And if she's not here, that means she lied to me. But why? 
What is she hiding from me now? I thanked Clara and headed towards the exit. Once in the car, I dialed my wife's number again. Piper, when will you be back from your club? I asked. I don't know. We're right in the middle of something. Why? Now I was sure Piper was blatantly lying to me. Nothing. Just wanted to spend the evening with you. We had an unpleasant conversation yesterday. I'll be back from work earlier today, hoping we could have a good time. I also have a gift for you, I lied. Piper replied that she wouldn't be back for another two hours. But my words about the gift intrigued her. She always loved gifts, even insignificant ones. And to understand what she was hiding from me, I now needed to play her game. Stopping by a store, I bought a trinket and returned home. At first, I thought about asking her directly where she had really been and what she was hiding from me. But if she had already started lying, I realized that she would lie again, and it would be difficult for me to catch her. I had to act as if I knew nothing and suspected nothing. When she returned at the appointed time, I warmly greeted her, and she immediately started asking what gift I had prepared for her. And I handed her a cheap brooch in the shape of a shiny butterfly. However, this time, Piper, for some reason, didn't show her usual delight, although she accepted the gift. It seemed very primitive to her, which she expressed to me. But I thought you'd like it. You always love such little things, I said. Yes. That was before. Now you won't please me with cheap jewelry. You could have noticed that yourself. I tried to rectify the situation with hugs, but Piper again said she was tired. I began to ask her how her day went, and in response, she started telling me that the day was rather dull, and they just shared recipes. I looked at her and saw how she shamelessly lied to me, not even feeling embarrassed. Later, when Piper went to the kitchen to prepare dinner, I reminisced about all recent events and tried to piece together a coherent picture. And apart from the fact that she might have another man, I couldn't think of anything else. I can't say I was very jealous, but over the years, I hadn't noticed anything like this about her, and I was sure of her sincere love for me. But now everything was different. And I was even surprised by this. If someone appeared in her life, why now, when she's not so young anymore? But, be that as it may, I suspected a bitter truth and intended to take all measures to find out what she was hiding. For this, I took a few days off work but still left the house. I didn't want my wife to find out that I intended to follow her. That's what I did when she started getting ready for her so-called club. I hoped I could immediately follow her to where she now goes instead of the club. But for the first two days, she didn't deviate from her route and met with other housewives. And I started to doubt my assumptions, thinking that maybe Piper was planning some surprise for our upcoming anniversary and simply didn't want to give herself away. And I was about to abandon my plan because of this thought. But on the third occasion, I noticed that Piper drove in a completely different direction. I followed her for several kilometers until her car stopped in one of the alleys. Then I saw how she leisurely approached one of the houses and took something out of her purse. It looked like she was about to open the door with her own key. Now I had even more questions. When Piper entered, I approached that house, hoping I could peek through the window and see what was happening there. Fortunately, the windows weren't completely covered and I could make out something. Until the last minute, I hoped that my suspicions were wrong and that my wife's behavior had a perfectly reasonable explanation. But what I saw later turned my whole world upside down. Through the window, I managed to see a guy, whose face I couldn't make out, holding Piper tightly, and she didn't resist at all. On the contrary, she seemed to be enjoying it, arching in pleasure and hugging him back. In that moment, I felt like I was set on fire and simultaneously doused with icy water. I couldn't sit still any longer, watching my wife embarrass me in our marriage. I instantly found myself at the door, which swung open forcefully as I pushed it, even causing a few splinters to fly. Then I went to where I saw my wife with her lover. They heard me as soon as I entered. However, Piper hadn't managed to put her blouse back on, the one that guy had pulled from her, and she just stared at me with frightened eyes. So, this is the kind of club you have? 
I hissed fiercely at her. You're such a slut. And who the hell are you? I didn't hold back and immediately went for him. I didn't know who he was, seeing him for the first time, but it was enough that he had approached my wife. Though he was bigger than me, I managed to knock him down, and we ended up on the floor. I wasn't going to let him off easily and kept landing blows wherever I could. Piper grabbed her blouse in fear and bolted out of the house. I didn't chase her, I wasn't in the mood for her at that moment. I was busy fighting the guy she preferred over me, which hurt a lot. But that pain fueled me, giving me strength even though I took a few hits myself. Eventually, when we both grew a bit weary, the fight started to wind down. That's when the guy decided to speak. Who the hell are you? Burst in like a madman. Who? I'm Piper's husband. Don't pretend like you didn't know. At first, I thought he was playing dumb. He recoiled and braced himself against the table not to fall. Then he leaned in a bit towards me and continued speaking. Seriously, man. First time hearing she's married. Although we've been seeing each other for quite a while. Those words enraged me again, and I punched him as hard as I could. But now, he didn't resist, only asking me to stop. I didn't know if I should believe him, but his words sounded convincing. And then, as I sat down, he briefly told me he'd been in town for a few months, came for his grandfather's funeral, and decided to stay briefly to do some repairs on the house and eventually sell it. So Piper knew this person was just passing through town. But why did she still decide to have a romance with him? What was she hoping for? He didn't seem particularly wealthy, and the house looked quite ordinary. I left him alone, warning him not to come close to my wife again, or next time, I'd simply kill him. I headed home, intending to have a serious conversation with my wife. I hoped she would at least have the conscience to come home rather than go elsewhere. When I pulled up to my yard, I noticed her car was already parked by the garage. I was still filled with anger and disappointment and I felt like I couldn't just talk to her. That image of her embracing and kissing someone else was still vivid in my mind. But I couldn't just let everything go, so trying to keep my composure, I entered the house. Piper was sitting on the couch, shamefully looking at the floor. She turned to me only when I entered the room. I wanted so badly to grab her and push her into the couch, then give her a piece of my mind. But I held back for now. Approaching her, I saw her trembling in fear and anticipating a hit from me. But I sat across from her and glared fiercely. Why? I uttered, and she flinched when the question came, hesitating to answer, only guiltily gazing at me. Then I felt my patience about to snap, and I asked again, but this time I shouted very loudly. Piper became even more frightened, started crying, and began saying she was not at fault, that he seduced her, and she was just a victim. I knew she was trying to lie to me again to get away with it, but I didn't believe her anymore. She'd lied to me so much before, I just couldn't believe her anymore. I walked over to her and grabbed her hair and turned her face towards me, leaning over her. You're lying bitch. You think I'm gonna believe you now? If you didn't want to, you wouldn't have gone with him. Now I'm asking you why and why with him. Answer me. I took a swing at her but I didn't hit her. I hoped it would just help her to tell the truth now. She flinched again, covering her face with her hands, and when she realized there had been no blow, she looked up at me and said with trembling lips, I'm sorry, Richard. It was just an argument with my friends. You weren't supposed to find out anything. Her answer killed me. It was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard in my life. But as much as I wanted to punch her in her lying mouth, I couldn't hit her. Maybe because she was a woman, maybe because I was used to her, and we had a daughter. Or maybe her already frightened look made me feel a little sorry for her. But at the same time, my heart was still broken, and I didn't want to leave it just forgiven and forgotten. Pushing my wife onto the couch, I stepped away, wanting to destroy everything around me. Pain and anger swirled inside, desperate to break free. I knew that if I exploded right there and then, the consequences would be dire. So, I headed towards the exit, intending to go drink at the nearest pub. 
But along the way, I angrily swept a trinket box off a table to release some of my rage. I had a few drinks before realizing alcohol wasn't helping. It only dulled me enough to ease my movements. But the beast inside still roared, and I went outside for fresh air, hoping someone would provoke me, someone I could release my negativity on. I stood there, yet no one pushed me to a fight. Only an older guy came out for a smoke, standing aside. Then it started to rain, but I stayed put, soaking wet. Sad thoughts raced through my mind, hoping the rain would wash them away. As I stood there, after a few minutes, I heard someone calling me. I turned and saw a taxi a few meters away, my old friend shouting my name from the open window. We've been friends since, probably, our school years. Why are you standing there? He yelled. You're soaking wet. Come here, I'll give you a ride. I walked up to him and dove into the car when he opened the door. He started asking what happened, even tried to joke that I got so drunk I wanted to bathe in the rain. But I wasn't in the mood for jokes. I wanted to share my sadness with him, yet, for some reason, I felt ashamed. So, I just told him I didn't want to go home. Bill probably understood that my troubles were at home and suggested going to his place. He had just returned from a trip and was heading home from the station. When we arrived, he offered me coffee, but I asked for another drink. Bill poured some whiskey into my glass without questions, but said he didn't want to see me just drunk. Thanks, buddy, I said, taking the glass. I'm just feeling really bad right now. Well, then tell me what happened. Maybe I can help, he said, caring. Unlikely. I'm just unlucky in life. I thought everything would be fine. I had a great family. But now, tragedy struck, and I don't know how to go on. Oh my god, something happened to Piper? He looked at me, but when I stayed silent, he got even more horrified. Melanie? Something's wrong with her? I shook my head negatively. Yet, I decided to share with my friend the reason for my gloomy mood. He listened attentively, occasionally expressing sympathy and pouring us both more drinks. When we drank, his wife entered the room. She didn't welcome alcohol, especially on an empty stomach, and her husband had just arrived, so she scolded us a bit. But Bill asked her to leave us. Leave? Stephanie asked, looking at me. You're setting up a pub here. Richard, I understand you're feeling bad. But that's not a reason to get my husband drunk. You understand? I snapped. You understand nothing. Are you in on this, too? Running some kind of racket here, and now you're defending her? Hey, hey. Jumped up immediately, Bill. Why are you going at her like that? He even stood up, ready to calm me down at a moment's notice. But I didn't fuel the fire further and apologized to Bill for losing control. However, I didn't apologize to Stephanie. Instead, I asked her what they really did in their club and what these silly disputes were about. Bill's wife didn't expect that, and her tone softened. That's when I realized she knew something, and Bill looked at her warily. What is he talking about, Stephanie? He asked his wife. She sat down near us, but hesitated to answer directly. Her wandering gaze revealed that she knew my wife's secret. Sorry, Richard. This shouldn't have happened. It was just a stupid joke. We didn't know what to do. It was so long ago. No one thought Piper would agree. Agree to what? Bill still didn't believe his wife was involved and even began to suspect he might be a cuckold. Well, we were playing a game, truth or dare, just wanted some fun. And Piper chose dare. So Clara decided to play a joke on her. The task was just to invite him out, nothing more. I don't know why Piper took it further. Stephanie seemed to be trying to excuse herself, so she wouldn't face her husband's anger. And he seemed to believe her, but I didn't feel any better, quite the opposite. If Stephanie was telling the truth, it meant my wife consciously cheated. I was sitting, feeling like I was covered in filth, wishing I could just disappear underground. 
If Stephanie had been a guy, I'd have punched her right then. But circumstances were in her favor, and I didn't want to quarrel with my friend. But for myself, I decided I'd tear that damn club apart. Thanking my friend for his support, I bid him farewell and called a taxi to head home, but he only let me go after I promised not to do anything stupid. Of course, I lied to him just to get him off my back, but I also realized I needed to act not recklessly in a fit of anger but devise a good plan that would help me punish all those responsible for my misery. Arriving home, I found my wife crying on the couch in the living room. It seemed she hadn't moved since I left the house. Seeing me, she rushed to me, begging for forgiveness again. Get away from me! I pushed her aside and headed to the kitchen. Now I wanted her to feel what I felt. I treated her as coldly as she had treated me. Additionally, I wanted to tell her to sleep in another room, but the bed smelled of her, so I decided to move myself instead. I even briefly considered having an affair just to make Piper feel what I felt. But at that moment, I didn't want any kind of relationship. I couldn't sleep at night, pondering my next steps, realizing it would be quite difficult to do it alone. So, I decided to talk to Bill, hoping for his help. After all, his wife was also part of that club, though she didn't visit it as frequently as Piper did. The next day, I stayed home in the morning. After breakfast, I called Bill and asked for a meeting. But he was at work and could only meet in the evening. I also asked if he could find out something about the man my wife was seeing. I didn't know his name, so I gave Bill the address where he lived. Bill didn't promise anything but said he'd see what he could do and reminded me not to do anything stupid. All right, bro, I replied to him. Just do what I ask. As soon as I finished the call, Piper entered the room. She didn't look the most appealing, as if she hadn't slept all night. What? I asked, looking down at her. She didn't reply, just headed towards the table where her purse was. I realized she was going somewhere and blocked her path. Let me go. I need to go to the store. We're missing something for lunch. There's no trace of the innocent lamb she was yesterday. To the store, huh? Or off to your lover? Did he become so precious to you? What did you find in him? What were you missing? I grabbed her hand and squeezed tightly. You wouldn't understand. We love each other, she quickly replied and immediately covered her mouth, as if she had said too much. All of yesterday's anger surged back in me. I had barely contained it, and here she was, tearing all the threads apart again. Love, huh? I couldn't hold back and slapped her. I wanted to drive her out of the house, never to see that traitor again. But as soon as I opened my mouth, she broke free, grabbed her purse, and rushed out of the house, casting an angry glance at me. Now I felt as if the whole world had conspired against me. I suspected she ran to him, and I couldn't stay idle anymore. I quickly got ready and soon was on my way to the house where her lover lived. I thought I'd catch her there and sort things out with both of them. But when I arrived, she wasn't there. The house was completely empty. I called and knocked on the door, even looked through all the windows, but there was no sign of anyone. Not knowing what to do, I sat down on the curb and called Bill again. He answered that he managed to find out something based on the information I gave him. Bill said that this person's name is Greg Makers and he indeed came here to sell his deceased grandfather's house. However, on the eve of the day when the buyers were supposed to come, for some reason, he abruptly changed his mind and now decided to settle in this house himself. His reasons were unknown, but he also said that Greg is not married at the moment but quite fond of women. At these words, Bill even fell silent for a short while. Perhaps he assumed that even his wife might have fallen into the clutches of this trickster. Listening to my friend, I decided to wait until Greg returned home. And I was sure that Piper would be with him. Parking the car a little further away, I watched his house, but I had to wait for a long time. A little later, Bill called me again and said that he remembered his detective friend and decided to try to get a little more information through him. Among other information about where Greg worked and in which cities he lived, Bill told me something else interesting. It turns out, 
This Greg sometimes traded in various antique items or valuables. Where he got them from remained unknown to anyone, but there were rumors that he acquired them illegally by visiting old houses or simply coaxing them from lonely old ladies. But this was yet to be proven. If that's the case, what did he forget in our town then? As it turned out, I knew his grandfather, but to say that he owned any treasures. I decided to ask Greg about it directly when he appeared, just out of curiosity. But I waited until evening, and no one approached his house. From sitting for so long, my body even felt a bit stiff, and I was getting ready to go home, thinking that Greg probably ran away after our confrontation. Looking at the clock, I saw that it was time to meet Bill, so I went to the bar where we agreed to meet. The friend didn't make me wait long, and soon we were discussing this topic. Marv told me that he's been interested in this person for a while, said Bill about his detective friend. Several years ago, he even started investigating a case related to him, but he didn't succeed. Greg disappeared, vanished from the city. And then somehow it was forgotten. And now he wants to come back here to deal with it again. And so? Do you think he'll find anything on him? Besides stealing other men's wives, he's unlikely to uncover anything, I replied skeptically. You're underestimating him. Marv has cracked many cases. And if he's decided, then it's worth it. And you? Have you made up with Piper? Ugh, I sighed heavily. I don't even know if that's possible now. She just left today. Bill looked at me questioningly. She just left. And she doesn't even regret what happened, I continued. I don't even know where she is now. Thought she went to him. But they weren't there. Don't worry. Marv will come tomorrow and figure it all out. We sat with a friend, had a few more beers, and then went home. After talking with my friend, I felt a little lighter inside, but the pain from my wife's betrayal didn't subside. I was preparing to accept that our marriage was over and I would never see her again. But when I got home, she was there, cooking something in the kitchen. I was even a little shocked that she was at home. So, did the lover not welcome you? I sarcastically asked. I wasn't with him. I told you I needed to go to the store, she replied dryly, but I didn't believe even that. Perhaps she just had a quarrel with Greg, or he listened to my advice and decided not to see her anymore, so she came back because there was nowhere else to go. Without saying another word to her, I went to my room. I didn't even want to have dinner with her. The next morning was more peaceful. But a couple of hours later, Bill called and now asked for a meeting, saying that Marv had arrived and would like to talk to me. During the meeting, I didn't tell him anything new that I hadn't told Bill before. Marv listened to me attentively and jotted something down in his notepad, looking quite pensive. And then he shared some information with us that even seemed interesting to me. It turns out that the old lady, after whom the empty house remained and in which our wives eventually set up their club, was from some noble family but lived her whole life as a recluse, never revealing her true background. And according to Marv, there should be quite a few valuables somewhere in her house. It seems that Greg was after them. And to get closer to this house, he apparently got involved with one of the participants. I said that the assumption was quite interesting, but how to prove that it was indeed so. Then Marv suggested going straight there. This day happened to be a break from meetings, and only one woman was in the club, taking her turn to clean. And today's turn was Piper's, she told me that when she left in the morning. I decided that it was a chance to find out once and for all whether my wife had left for him because if that was the case, he would definitely be in that house. I didn't care about the story with the valuables, and I didn't believe in all of this. But without much thought, we headed there. Parking nearby, we walked up. The door was locked from the inside. But Marv had a talent not only for unraveling cases. He pulled out a pick from his pocket and used it. When we entered, the house was quiet. Moving forward, I almost thought there was nobody here at all and Piper had just fled again for a date with Greg. But when we entered the next room, I found her tied to a chair and unconscious. Marv rushed to her immediately and after a few movements, he brought her back to consciousness. 
She looked at us as if she were drunk and had difficulty understanding what was happening. But then she finally explained that Greg had treated her like that, all the while asking where some stash was. But she had no idea what he meant. They had spent so much time here but hadn't found any stashes. Then Marv suggested going down to the basement, and he was right because approaching the door behind which was a dark staircase, we heard a rustle. Carefully descending, we noticed Greg rummaging there, digging into several places on the walls, and even the floor was already in holes in some places. I didn't hesitate and immediately lunged at him as soon as he saw us. I wanted to beat him myself, but Bill intervened and convinced me that it would be better if we just tied him up and let the police deal with him. While we dealt with Greg, Marv continued his investigation. He took out his notepad and then approached an old boiler, feeling a latch there. After a few more manipulations, Marv managed to find the hideout. I can't put into words the greedy look in Greg's eyes when he saw the found valuables. He tried to break free, but Bill and I struck him from both sides simultaneously. This rendered Greg unconscious. I won't dwell on what we did with the treasures. I can only say that I got my share and used it all for my daughter's education. Eventually, Greg was sentenced for unlawfully obtaining treasures and selling them on the black market, as well as deceiving many people. With the information Marv gathered, he got the maximum sentence for him. Piper was crushed that Greg's love turned out to be fake, and she was now very ashamed that she fell for his advances and betrayed me. I haven't forgiven her yet. But I bought her a separate house and gave her the opportunity to prove over time that she deserves forgiveness, and she tried almost every day for that, even quit the club. Now her only occupation was to strive for the chance to return to the family. History 2 Just last week, I found out that my 24-year-old fiancé cheated on me with her boss. The guy is maybe in his mid-40s, I guess. He's married and has three kids, by the way. This all went down last November during a work trip when they were out of town. They got together three times, if you can believe it. How do I have this info? Well, her boss's wife actually messaged me on Facebook and spilled the beans. She even showed me messages and emails. They exchanged talking in detail about how they cheated on both of us and managed to pull it off. They even laughed about it. But then, in the same messages, she'd tell him she loves me and that they need to keep this secret. The boss's wife, who I've met and seen nice at company events, understandably went ballistic and heartbroken. She's getting ready to serve him with divorce papers tomorrow. She's also planning to send a polite email to their HR department. So here I am, sitting on my phone typing this while my fiancé is on the other side of the room sitting on the couch, using her computer to plan a honeymoon for a wedding that's not going to happen. She has zero clue that her world is going to shatter tomorrow. I can't say I've got any sympathy left in me since my own situation fell apart just last week. Whenever I go through those texts and emails, it's like someone stabbing me in the heart with a knife. Three years down the drain. Although I'm grateful I found out before we tied the knot, well, at least I have that to be thankful for. She's clueless about my plan, but I've taken a day off tomorrow. Once she heads off to work, I'm going to go around my place, gather all her stuff, pack it up, and leave it by the door. Then I've got to figure out if I can get any of the money I already spent on the wedding refunded. The wedding was supposed to go down in October, but clearly, that's not happening. When she walks in after work, I'll kick her out of my apartment and my life. I considered posting those screenshots on her Facebook, but my sister talked me out of it. I also thought about giving her parents a call. I feel bad for them because they're really good folks, and I'll miss her family. They've treated me like one of their own, and I'm not sure how they'll react, but I've made up my mind that she can explain herself to them. I don't want to hear her excuses or lies. At this point, all I want is for her to get out of my life so I can figure out what the heck I'm going to do next. Holy smokes, I can't wrap my head around the response this has stirred up. The bomb has definitely been detonated. Around 8-ish, my phone went bonkers with her calls, each one followed by a voicemail. I figured out right off the bat what was going down. I dialed up my sister right away to spill the beans to her. She told me to stay strong and offered to come over and keep me company if I wanted, so that's exactly what she's doing. Then I had this seriously tough convo on the phone with my ex's mom. 
Crazy, I'm actually dealing with an ex now. It was tough because this lady hasn't done a darn thing to deserve the hurt. I could hear in her voice, her whole family, from the get-go, treated me like gold. I tried to calmly lay out the situation to her mom and let her know that I just can't find it in me to forgive this mess, and I'll be asking my ex to hit the road. Despite being pretty upset, her mom seemed to get why I feel this way. She even suggested swinging by my place to help my ex gather her stuff. Not a bad idea, I guess. Next, I shot off some texts to a couple of my closest buds to fill them in on what's going on. Man, my phone's been blowing up with messages from them ever since, but I've let them know I'll catch up with them as soon as I can. Right now, though, I'm straight up drowning in all this. I checked out one voicemail from my ex, and it played out just as I figured, her crying and begging me to call her because we seriously need to talk. I rang her up, no answer, so I started shooting her texts. As soon as I did, she rang me back in a flash. She went into this whole apology routine. Why did I have to go and call her mom? She asked. Why did I bring other people into this mess? I totally lost my cool. I straight up asked her how she thinks I'm feeling having to go get checked for STDs because my own fiancé went and cheated on me. Can you even imagine how embarrassing that is? At least she didn't try to deny what she did. I told her she needs to swing by this afternoon to pick up her stuff from my place, and that we're officially done. She said we'll have a more in-depth talk later, but I shut her down real quick and told her there's not much left to talk about, is there? I also questioned her about how she and this dude could badmouth me and his own wife, like they had a laugh about how she gained weight after having three kids. It's just heartless, especially since that poor woman didn't deserve any of this. I sure didn't deserve it either. I also brought up the fact that she shouldn't even think about using the excuse of feeling pressured because the guy is her boss. Her texts make it pretty darn clear that she was more than willing to go along with all of this. I reckon she's got a meeting with HR at her job today, and the whole office is buzzing about their little escapade. I can't find an ounce of sympathy for either of them at this point. I'm already emotionally wiped out, and it's not even 10 a.m. where I am. So once she wraps up her HR chat, I guess she's headed over here to pick up her stuff. I'm hoping it all goes down with minimal drama. My sis should be here, and I'm crossing my fingers that her mom tags along. The landlord says she'll be around. Two, and she's sorting out changing the locks for me. Hopefully, that'll happen either this afternoon or tomorrow. I know this might seem like a rambling post, but I was trying to remember a bunch of things I said, and my mind's racing like crazy right now. Well, she's out of here. She did come over with her mom and her best friend, and my sister was also present. No shouting, no arguing. She asked if we could talk alone, but I told her that wouldn't be wise as she said everything she needed to say in those text messages with her boyfriend. Predictably, the waterworks started flowing, and her mom assured me they'd make this as swift as possible. So, she and her friend went and grabbed some of her stuff, enough for a day or two. While she was away, her mom apologized to me and mentioned that she didn't raise her daughter to behave this way. She inquired if the guy is truly married, and I confirmed, yeah, he's married. Her mom appears to be quite devastated by this whole mess. As they were getting ready to leave, I questioned, and what about my ring? Doesn't seem like it means much to you. Her friend seemed like she wanted to say something, but a glance or a signal made her promptly close her mouth. I wouldn't bet a dime in Vegas that her friend wasn't in the know about this all along. She acted like she wasn't going to hand over the ring, and her mom snapped, give him the damn ring. So her friend reluctantly passed the ring to her mom, and her mom handed it to me, once again expressing her apologies. I just let it fall on my coffee table, I don't even want to look at the thing. I suppose she's going to return for the rest, the first batch tomorrow with her dad. My sister mentioned she'd love to pull the girl's hair out by the roots, her words, not mine. But right now, I'm so utterly defeated by all of this that all I want to do is lie down and catch some sleep. History 3 My wife, a 46-year-old woman, had strong connections with the women in her neighborhood. She had a knack for socializing and was always out and about whenever she mentioned having a meeting or some social event to attend. I took her word for it without question. Over a span of eight years, 
she orchestrated numerous gatherings, becoming the town's most reliable source of gossip, all while nurturing more than 40 friendships. Among her close companions was a woman named Virginia. Virginia, like my wife, was married and had two young children. I suspect that my wife envied the lifestyle Virginia enjoyed, they were well-to-do, and even though we managed to pay our bills, Virginia's family seemed to revel in a bit more luxury. On a fateful day, a different friend of my wife, Samantha, called me up. She expressed concern because she hadn't seen my wife around lately. This was deeply unsettling, for as far back as I could remember, my wife had been going out with her friends at least twice a week. However, she never shared any specifics with me. I inquired with Samantha if my wife had been attending the usual gatherings that she anticipated her to be present at. Samantha confirmed this, but she also added that she wasn't the only one noticing my wife's absence. She might have been the first to call me about it, though. According to her, my wife seemed to have disappeared off the radar for them. She was in the midst of organizing a charity 5K event to raise funds for families in need in our area when she suddenly went silent. Apparently, she had mentioned to one of the girls that she needed some space, but it had been approximately two months since anyone had seen her in person, which left them genuinely worried. I hung up with Samantha just moments before my wife walked into the room. She was dressed elegantly, sporting dangling earrings and a foam-fitting dress. Her curls bounced with each step, and her heels echoed as she informed me that she was heading out for a grand dinner with friends, celebrating Samantha's birthday, the same Samantha who had just called me expressing her worry for my wife's safety. I sensed something was terribly amiss. My thoughts raced, and my heart thudded in my chest. I couldn't allow her to just walk away. I gently took her hand and planted a kiss on it. I told her I'd drive her to the dinner because I wanted more time to appreciate her. She grew incredibly anxious, trying to persuade me that it wasn't necessary. I, however, insisted repeatedly, perhaps more than I should have, making the situation awkward. As we got into the car, she gave me directions to the dinner. She mentioned that it was being hosted by Virginia, the same close friend I'd heard of before, the one who was also married. That information triggered a memory, a recent Facebook post by Virginia discussing her upcoming week-long trip. What stood out was my wife's comment wishing her a safe journey. All this transpired just three days ago. My heart raced, my palms grew sweaty, and my grip tightened on the steering wheel. I was clueless about how to navigate the impending situation. My wife's voice cut through, questioning my insistence on driving her when I'd need to rush back home to catch the kickoff. I could see right through her game. She intended to create a scenario where I wouldn't have time to accompany her to the door or delve deeper into her deceit. I bantered with her, suggesting that I didn't need to catch it since one of the players would. She appeared uneasy, hesitating before admitting that she felt bad I couldn't join since it was a women-only dinner. My anger swelled, her words sounded far too suspicious. I pulled the car to a stop, and my wife's expression turned to horror as I shut off the engine and unbuckled my seatbelt. She leaned in for a kiss and casually mentioned me picking her up at nine. I agreed, but to her surprise, I stepped out of the car and walked beside her. She halted, giving me a puzzled look. I shared that I wanted to be the gentleman and walk her to the door. She insisted I didn't need to, telling me to just go back home. Her rejection was pretty deliberate, yet I just grinned. I strolled up to the front door with her, and her nerves were palpable when I knocked firmly. She froze in place, her mouth agape. I glanced at her, struggling not to burst into laughter or point out how strangely she was acting. AP swung the door open, clad in a plush robe marked with his initials. At first, he appeared somewhat pleased, but that quickly gave way to evident nervousness. Speaking in a clear voice, I greeted him and stepped inside, explaining that I was escorting my wife to the women's only dinner hosted by Virginia. Curiously, I inquired about the absence of all the women, yet neither of them budged. I playfully ribbed my wife for her declaration of arriving late when, in reality, she was early. As they remained rooted there, jaws hanging open, I drew their attention to the dinner table set for two, complete with filled wine glasses, and put on a perplexed expression. AP's face started to turn a shade of purple, yet he remained tight-lipped. In a feeble voice, my wife mentioned that the girls were running late. I responded with a loud, is that so? 
and inquired about Virginia's whereabouts. A silence hung for a moment before my wife suggested that Virginia might have dashed to the store for something. She attempted to involve AP in her cover-up, but he was visibly annoyed. He straightforwardly said that playing games was futile, and I saw through their deception. He declared they were caught, and the charade was over. At this point, my wife's composure wavered, showing signs of distress. AP didn't mince words. He ordered us out of his house, almost pushing us through the front door. Just before he closed it, I dropped a hint that it wouldn't bode well if someone were to tell his wife about the situation. He froze, locked eyes with me, and questioned my intentions. I made it clear that I wanted him to provide me with any evidence of his affair with my wife so the divorce proceedings would lean in my favor. Seeing his hesitation, I reminded him that two marriages didn't need to be ruined, but I warned him that I wouldn't hold back if he didn't assist me. He reluctantly agreed to provide evidence. When my wife heard his admission, she lost her composure, letting out a scream, snatching the keys from my hand, and driving off in a hurry. I managed to catch a ride back home and discovered that she had packed some of her belongings and taken her car. Soon enough, I received the proof from AP, a collection of messages and images that left no room for doubt. My lingering questions were all answered, they had undoubtedly been intimately involved numerous times. I had initially intended to hold off on revealing everything to Virginia until after the divorce was finalized, but patience was a virtue I couldn't uphold. It didn't take much longer for Virginia to commence her retaliation against my wife. With knowledge of her mother's location and the ongoing divorce proceedings, it was a safe bet that my wife would be staying there. Rumors spread that Virginia was behind the act of slashing my wife's car tires and etching an unkind word onto the hood. AP and my wife parted ways through divorce, and my ex-wife was ostracized from the circle of women in the community. Now she's left with no money, no friends, no husband, and absolutely nothing to show for her 46 years of life.